so it might be worth saying, first of all, that the aim of this session is not about crypto, this chat. Um, it's about how one goes from something small to big. Um, and we had the opportunity to invite Richard here uh, to discuss how we achieve this with his various companies. Um, and hopefully we can kind of take what we find today to our um, workshops tomorrow about the bigger picture, whoever will be here for that. So I think first off, Richard. Um, so Nano is uh, David to Bitcoin's kind of Goliath. Put it that way. You had the same with Innocent Smoothies um, and kind of Tropicana, those other companies were your glass. Can you walk us through kind of how you overcame that and kind of the challenges that you faced, I think? Yeah, well, I, I certainly agree with the analogy. Um, when we set out and we started from literally a market store, we bought 500 pounds worth of fruit, crushed it up, made a thousand bottles of smoothies and took them to a market store and started selling them and um, had real jobs at the time trying to work out actually it was a test to see if people liked it or not, whether we should commit to it or not. So we put a big sign up above the stall that said, should we give up our, should we give up our jobs to make these smoothies? And had a bin that said yes on the front and a bin that said no and made a commitment to each other that you know, we would sell the smoothies, get people to vote with the empty bottles. And if the bin was full at the end of the weekend, we'd resign from our jobs. And it was, um, there was a few in the no bins, which actually, funny enough, this is, this is like now 20 years ago, it was only seven years ago, our parents confessed, they're the ones that people in the bottles in the no bin, because they're worried about us giving up our jobs. <laughs> but. So we started, uh, that was how we started, and we were instantly against, because the, obviously the supermarkets and the retailers, they don't care about any of that stuff. They've got a very small amount of shelf space, and they've got to choose a juice brand, and they can choose from ones that are backed by the Coca-Cola, or Pepsi-Cola, or Unilever, Unilever or Danone, or this sort of funny little startup. And that was the situation, and so I guess, you know, Nano versus Bitcoin is a comparable situation in terms of scale and brand awareness and financial clout. So your question is, so how the hell do you win? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I, I guess, to the extent there's a recipe, the, the, the single most and important ingredient, and I'm not telling you guys anything you don't already know, is that you just have to be better. And not better in some sort of obtuse, academic, or you know, arguable technical way, but better in a way that is meaningful to your user. And in smoothies, we were clear on one thing, right? The purpose of having a smoothie is to have a sort of holistically pleasant experience so that it will taste good and do you good. And our smoothies, in sort of the parlance of your world, they were engineered better because they were made from freshly squeezed juice rather than concentrates. They didn't have preservatives. They didn't have flavoring. So the very nature of them, they were genuinely better tasting and better for the consumer. So for the two biggest reasons why I have a smoothie were beating the competition. And so it was a meaningfully meaningful difference. And so Nana, what it has to be is meaningfully better than Bitcoin. And so the question is, what are those two or three ways in which is... The, the meaningful way to, 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 to actually give the end user a better experience. And I missed the demonstration, but in terms of an instant real life transaction at the point of purchase, yeah. instantly verified, I, I'm no nano guy, but that to me, I'm a consumer, that makes me feel like, that's a meaningfully better experience. It's out in the real world, it works, it's, it's right in front of you and it, it's credible. So yeah, how do you win? There's no shortcut to it. You have to be better. Uh, you have to be lucky. A huge amount of innocent was we were just born in an era where we set up a business that was all about taste and health and ethics because that's what we cared about. It just so happened that the world was just suddenly switching on to the world of sort of ethics in the food chain and the importance of healthy eating. So you have to have sort of luck in times of timing and context. Now, is Nano existing in the right era for itself? I would say uh, absolutely. And as we all think, as we sat here, we're at the beginning, really, of what's going to be happening to society in terms of sort of the, 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 this form of, of handling money. Um, and you have, to get, you have to get well known. You have to get understood. You have to get famous for that beneficial difference, not famous for the other stuff, too. So it always comes down to a clear-sighted analysis, really, of what is your main reason for existing? Are you better at delivering against that need state than the competition? And are you making sure that at every single possible opportunity you're communicating that and getting understood for that? I think that kind of leads us on into the kind of the next question, just about standing out from the crowd and your competitors. Um, so I know you're going to hate this, but you are known for creating wackaging. 
So can you tell us kind of how the origin of Wackaging came about? I can see your face already. Um, and kind of the initial thoughts behind like branding like that. <laughs> so yeah, Wackaging is a term that we absolutely did not invent and is not a, a, a term that we would use of ourselves. It's a term that's been used to talk about the fact that our packaging from the beginning, we would write around the back sort of silly, interesting copy, making jokes in the ingredients panel, just making sure that every time you read it, it, it was different. Uh, it was sort of a, I guess, a digital approach in an analog world of just trying to keep things updated, current, fresh, different. And, and that was the, the reason for doing it. And um, what I loved about it was there was no variable cost to doing it, right? When you send off a label to print, you're going to be printing 10 up, as in like there's 10 sort of molds for the label. And normally people, you have to make each one individually. It costs absolutely different because you're making each one individually, whether one's got body copy different to the next one, to the next one, to the next one. So when we're printing 10 up, we were just printing 10 different labels, which meant we always had stuff out that the average frequency of purchase is maybe once every two weeks, and we're changing labels every three months. So actually, you just do the maths, it all, all figures. So you can, I think if you're clever and you just sort of, again, just sort of approach things analytically as much as you approach them creatively, find ways to differentiate yeah. that is original and cheap or in, in, in fact zero variable cost. And in, in every brand, in every business, in every sector, in every bit of society, there's a way to do it. I don't know what all those ways are, but if you set yourself the challenge of, because it comes to my, my early point, no, no one cares about anything really, right? All the things that we care about tend to be the person that we fancy, what we're having for tea, um, the, you know, my boss being annoying, I'm tired. These are sort of the things that most of the time we're, we're caring about. We really don't care about a fruit juice brand. I mean, it's just not high up in anyone's order of things to ever think about. Your, your best hope as a sort of brand guy is you may by luck, get someone to give you half a second of their attention once. And so you have to make sure when you do get that opportunity, you definitely stand out and you're definitely memorable. And in my world, that was the job of the packaging, actually. The physical packaging was, firstly, am I noticed? Secondly, am I desired? Thirdly, am I understood? Fourthly, am I remembered? And so again, like with Innocent, we were sort of seen as being, a, you know, in relative context of futures, we're seen as a creative company. We're not writing movies or designing buildings. Well, actually, we did design buildings by the end of it. But, <laughs> but wow, you can apply creativity and creative thinking to anything, and packaging was just one of those things. But it just keeps coming back to getting noticed, getting understood, getting remembered. And you came up with... Um uh, the concept of the kind of changing and, and being quite humorous on packaging through what film was it? Oh, yeah, I mean, like every good idea Innocent had is just something we stole from somewhere else. This idea <laughs> of like having constantly changing copy came from a movie called Kingpin. I don't know if anyone's seen it. It's like a sort of Farley Brothers sort of like sort of daft comedy movie. And there's just one scene where his, a, a friend goes to see his. Uh, his mate and he, he goes around to his house and he's desperate for the toilet and he says you've got anything to read while I'm on the toilet and he patches him a bottle of shampoo and he looks at it and goes oh no I've read that one already and I just saw that movie and I thought oh yeah why is packaging yeah. always the same and it's just one of those questions why is something the way it is and there's no reason why packaging always has to be the same you can make it a bit more interesting and yeah I'm not trying to make out the innocent packaging of some great literary work of fiction but on an average date it's more interesting to read the back of an innocent bottle than the back of someone else's fruit juice bottle because the other people's fruit juice bottle just says your statutory nights are not affected and has a barcode whereas we've got like some stupid story or some joke or a puzzle or a fact or just mm. just a, a thing to maybe just maybe in a good day remember us by or tell your mate about and that's how you get a brand from zero with no advertising no money to spend She's now the biggest juice brand in Europe and is launching actually next week in, in, in Tokyo and in Shanghai. So it's, on, it's set from being the Europe, Europe's biggest juice brand to now hopefully one day the world's just by working the differences. Yeah, fantastic. So, I mean, obviously with all kind of startups and as we are kind of with Nano, being such kind of a small streamlined team, I know you started Innocent uh, with your two best friends and Jam Jar Investments as well. Um, kind of, what have you learned about kind of teamwork through this experience and working with such close friends of yours and the leadership that it takes to kind of run such companies like that? Mm. Oh, you know, it's a great question. I mean, you know, there's sort of 
Oh, there's several things. Now, my personal experience is if I've, I set up a business with my best mate 20 years ago, and um, people always said, oh, mate, that's a bad idea. You're really going to do it with your friends. What if it all goes wrong? And for me, it was just like, well, that's sort of kind of fear-based thinking. For me, there's this massive advantage of being each other's best mates. It's like, firstly, there's trust. Super important. Probably the single most effective business tool there is. Mm-hmm. People are trusting each other. Secondly, total awareness of each other's strengths and weaknesses. I know when to be listening to Adam in terms of what he's really good at, and, uh, and the same with John. Um, and thirdly, just a, a way to keep a cohesion around a team, because there's more than just ourselves as colleagues. There's, there's, a, there's an extra sort of dimension to it. And we were extremely blessed, and this is the reason why we did it as a team, is that we all were wildly different in the things that we cared about. John was essentially a sort of human computer that just wanted to build supply chains and be in factories, which I hated the idea of. Adam massively focused on doing the deal and growing and selling again, which I lived in fear of. And, and I was just obsessed with colors and shapes and making nice tasting liquids. And so I was the brand and product guy and we all looked in horror at each other's jobs. So I think that was the, the sense of it. There's a, cohe- a cohesion around values about the things that we hold important, about wanting to create a business that we can be proud of, both financially, but also socially and ethically and creatively, but completely com compatible set of skills and so that's the first thing now as investor we look for is like have you got cohesion have you got complementary skills do you guys know each other because you're just about to embark on a relationship and it's like starting up a business with, with people you don't know it's like going on a first date and getting married straight you know, for the beginning you're married it's like it might actually work out it might be great but most of the time it's better to have some form with people to know what their strengths and weaknesses what they're good at so you know as a, a business that meeting this morning that we're just thinking of investing and it was like, it's my first question. It was like, how do you all know each other? Yeah. How, for how long? How well? Have you worked together? Have you been on holidays together? It's just like, do you, do you know, can you vouch for this person? Because you're about to do something incredibly difficult and complicated and stressful. You want to sort of test the sort of like the, 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 the plumbing all connects. Yeah. Um, but again, for me, there's a massive advantage if you, if you can do it with your friends because it is for me personally one of the greatest things that's happened in my life, I've done it, and I've done it with my best mates, and the friendships got stronger, and the business benefited from it, and we left Innocent on a Friday after we sold it. We had them jam jar on the Monday. It was like, no, no, we just want to hang out with each other and do something interesting. So, at first, it worked. We have quite a similar thing um, with, we've got such a small team at Nano, um, and obviously speaking to each other every single day, we are like family, which is very lovely, and our community as well. Um, you know, 100,000 people all innovating at the same time all around Nano, which is fantastic. But that kind of moves on to kind of jam jar investments. Um, so as a kind of another startup, can you firstly talk us through um, that kind of company and, um, and what you kind of look at for your investments with jam jar? Yeah, well, we, we certainly have a, an area of the world that we focus on, which is challenger brands in the consumer space. So maybe we're, we're basically we're looking for Davids yep. to go up against big Goliaths um, in any way in consumer, both online, offline, you know, the ones that are, are hybrids. Um, the single first deal we did was Deliveroo. We did it at a business plan stage. It's gone on to be the latest round, which has been valued at $2 billion by Amazon. It's set up by Genius called by Will Shu. It's, it's deeply sophisticated, uses technology, but it completely understands humans that we just want our burger here quickly. Yeah. And, and, and I love that sort of people. You need to be able to build the greatest sort of back system in the world whilst never letting that interfere with what the consumer cares about. In fact, the back system is only there to deliver literally in this case, what the consumer cares about. And since then, we've, we've done another 49 deals, we're up to 50. Uh, they all share a sense of, is it gonna make the world better? Are we gonna be proud of being investors in it? Do we love the people? Do we rate the team? Do we think that if it, we accept that most things will fail, they have to, right? It's just the statistics. But the question is, if this is one of the outliers that can be successful, will it be big? Because yeah. there's plenty of business you look at and go, you know what, that could definitely, it stands a good chance of being you know, relatively successful, but the successful version of that is still only going to be like a sort of relatively small thing, and that we find ultimately less appealing because you're losing so much money all over the place. You need to be backing the ones that can really sort of uh, deliver big. But yeah, I have to say I'm 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 blessed because basically my job at the moment really is going from sort of room to room, meeting smart, weird, mad, crazy people, which is how you describe an entrepreneur, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Setting up their business and each day it's a different thing, so you're sort of you're constantly in learn mode. But because of our experience of Innocent, we did for 15 years from, say, from market stall to a you know, multi-billion dollar turnover company that sold to Coca-Cola, 
you've got something to offer. Mm. And we can offer help in the world's brand and culture and change and supply chains and all that kind of stuff. So it's about l learning and, and, and helping. And there's sort of two nice sort of things to be involved in. And have you, um, whether you can tell us or not, but have you seen a startup recently in the last kind of couple of months that's really excited you, that kind of stands out from the crowd in your sense with Jam Jar? Yeah, I mean, I, the, literally, the reason I was a little bit late is I <laughs> was just, I was so engaged in the previous meeting, which some guys have invented some tech which is going to instantly continually read your lactic acid using a combination of proprietary thing that they've invented which is non-invasive doesn't draw blood which is the only way of doing it currently and gives you real-time information and it's going to be pitched absolutely at the very 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 highest high performance athletes in the world and you think i i, I just i want one <laughs> it's cool the guys are smart they're yeah. young they're engineers they built it it's not a it's not like a theory they've got it i put it on my arm it works and you think so you just on a daily basis, you're experienced, exposed mm. to that stuff. So I kind of thought investing was going to be a bit boring versus running a company because Innocent was so it was like 15 hours a day, massively engaging. You're solving a thousand problems a day, all that kind of stuff. Investing is just, it's definitely a quieter energy. Yeah. But oh my God, you just sort of like, every room you walk into, you come out sort of knowing something about the world that you didn't know before and that's sort of that's quite a good journey to be on and being with i guess kind of um disruptive and kind of challenging challenger startups i guess you see things that you never even thought was even possible i think at the drop of a hat and through you know walking through a room and you're doing your lactic acid or then the next room is going to be the next delivery or something like that well so. i actually think you've gone absolutely to the heart of the matter that's exactly you've got to be finding people that are currently are at least breaking secrets or solving mysteries or doing stuff. It's not happened before if you're a challenger brand. Yeah. It's like if it's another tea bag company, great respect in the world to tea bag companies. I understand it. It's possible. It's, it, there's a lot of tea bags out there, but these guys, it's never been done. And it's like, but they've they've sort of hacked the system and found a different way to do it. You go. So and if it's going to work. But it might, and if it did, they, they, they really will be unique in the world in offering it. And do you, at Jamjar, when you decide to invest in a startup, do you kind of walk them through a process? Do you kind of, do you become involved in their journey as much as, as a kind of a, an educational factor, I guess, from what you've learned at Innocent? Uh, no is the short answer, yeah. because, um, look, we're entrepreneurs first and, uh, and investors second, and we know this, and as you guys know this, you're not going to tell an entrepreneur what to do, yeah. right? Waste of, waste of your time, waste of their time. What you've got to do is be available on their request mm. to help. Yeah. And that's the ethos. So we've got people that we have literally written a check to and we haven't seen for the last for, for three years because they're just getting on with it and they know what they're doing or what we, what we can offer is not relevant to them. But I, on the other end of the spectrum, I, I've literally recently been crouched in my wardrobe inside my bedroom at, midnight on a Saturday whispering into the phone because the founder of the business wanted to run through the body copy that he was putting on the first advert he was about to release to be printed and so you, you know they're the extremes of the two experience normally what it is you're sort of you know you're hearing them from on a sort of you know maybe like a month to month basis on average and it's just you can offer empathy at the yeah. very least because we've been there we can offer network because that's what we do now we can offer insights in how to connect with consumers and how to build a supply chain but we would never, ever presuppose to sort of, we know what you should yeah. be doing. It's like, you know what you're doing, but we, let us know if we can help. And so I know you've got kind of fingers in all the pies, lots of different things going on. Uh, but something that you have done is write a book uh, called If I Could Tell You Just One Thing. And as 62 kind of remarkable people, I think, across the world that you've asked to kind of contribute um, to this. Um, can you tell us firstly, this is going to be quite hard, your favourite kind of contribution, um, and then I'll lead on into the next one, perhaps. Well, it, I mean, it's, it's, no, it's actually an easy one to answer. It just makes me always feel a little bit embarrassed because this was a book I did. It raises money for charity to help sort of mentoring and social projects across the world, and it's going to see remarkable people that either something deeply remarkable has happened to them or they've achieved something remarkable. So everything from the best of times to the worst of times, from an Afghan vet that's had three of his limbs blown off in battle through to the Dalai Lama via Bill Gates, President Clinton, 32 men, 32 women, all have done something achievable, best of times, worst of times. And it was the most life enthralling, enhancing experience I've ever had because I'm, just, I'm in the room with some incredible people. I'm learning some deeply important stuff because everyone's piece of advice was singularly different and that was the question of after all you've learned if you're going to pass on one piece of advice what would 
what would it be? But having met all these incredibly deeply profound and wonderful people, I have a clear favourite, and that was Simon Cowell. And it's really embarrassing to admit that, but he was just so warm and interesting and nice and funny. And, and in his world, he's the most successful person at what yeah. he does, and he worked so hard, but he had so much time and patience, and it was like, I, I, I completely fell in love with him. Fair. And so, last of all, what would be the one thing that if you could tell us kind of about Nano Foundation and kind of community at Nano, if you could, you know, with that, if you can contribute, if we were collecting, collating those kind of quotes, what would be yours to us? Well, actually, my, fa my favourite person to meet was Simon Cowell, but the favourite bit of advice I got was from a relationship counsellor called Esther Perel, who, uh, she just gave this very sort of very basic insight, which, you know, you sort of go, well, yeah, actually, of course that's true, but I don't know if I was mindful of it. It's like, you said, your quality of life is, is directly driven by the quality of your relationships. Mm -hmm. So actually, the best way to improve your quality of life is to w it, put more into and improve the quality of your relationships between your friends and the family, and that you're the people that are, are yet you are most close to and spend the most of your time with. So I would take that sort of life advice and my own sort of personal experience and also the sort of the, the rationale by which we invest and say, the single most important thing to do to achieve something exceptional, which what you guys are doing, is, is, is teaming up. Yep. is collaboration. If we want a great future, we, we're all going to know how to share it. And I don't want to resort into sort of cliches, but you, you, just, you just achieve so much more in a sort of tight band of people that have got a shared vision, yep. but bring different things to that community. And I think that's a description of what you guys are with Nano, right? Yep, Massive, big, audacious goal. Mm -hmm. Tight group of people, hugely committed, all bringing something unique but which absolutely can help deliver the goal that you're trying to take on. Fair. So we're going to open up to um, a few questions on the floor. So has anyone got any questions that they would like to ask Richard? Uh, I was wondering if you could uh, give us a little background about you uh, and uh, how do you start this business of, of uh, smoothies and why? Yeah, no, uh, great question. So I, well, I'm from Yorkshire originally. I was sort of born into privilege in the sense that, for me, the greatest privileges are I was born healthy to a loving family um, and brought up in that context. You know, my dad worked for a local bus company. My mum was a nurse that went to work nights to pay for me to have a good education. That combination of sort of like that sort of working class sort of aspiration and my parents working their nuts off got me to a school in the local area that got me like switching. Because I, I went to that school at age 13 and in the first year I was 44 out of 45. And it, it's the, because it's the first time I'd ever come across any sort of academic challenge. I didn't even know what an exam was, and I went home and went 44 out of 45, and I think that's great. And the next year, I was 17 out of 45, and I remember going home to my parents and going, look how much I've improved. And my mum, in a really nice way, but she was the one like, going out and working nights as a nurse to pay for this education, goes, well, I think you can do better than that. And it was the first time I thought, fuck, really? And then the next year, I was, I was second. So I went through a sort of like from the bottom of the class to the top of the class over two years. And anyway, a fortunate... Good, good teacher spotted me, said, you should go to this thing called Cambridge. I literally didn't know what Cambridge University was. I wanted to go to Nottingham because that's where the best nightclubs were at the time. And I was totally obsessed with house music and DJing. But I went to Cambridge, thought it was all right. Went there, hated it at first, then met some people. Come always comes back to people. I met Adam John, became best mates. Used to organize club nights, used to DJ. Threw it together as a threesome, realized how much we'd love working together, and then set that goal of one day we should set up a business together. When we graduate, we didn't have the confidence to do it straight out of college, but we'd share houses together, go on holiday together, have kept having the same conversation. Wouldn't it be great one day to set up a business together? And after basically four years of talking about it, we're on a snowboarding weekend, hung over, and we said, Look, we've either got to stop saying this or actually do it, otherwise, we're going to drive ourselves some drive ourselves mad and so we said by the end of the weekend we'll have a business idea or we're going to shut the fuck up and it was our smoothies was our third idea inspired by our hangovers that we felt grim and we wanted to do something that was healthy and we thought well that would be a good solution for us and we knew other 26 year olds like us that would need it so we came back and we could get our head around it it's like smoothies fruit juice can't be that difficult hence buying the fruit crushing the bottles taking it to the market stall and before we know it we've left our decent jobs and we're, we're, we're crushing up fruit and putting it into bottles and selling that for a living. And we've started out in, in a van, going around to the local shops in our neighborhood, saying, hi, we're your new local neighborhood juice company. 
would you like some? And they would go, no, thank you. It's too expensive. And then we'd go, well, have it anyway. Put it on the shelves. And if it doesn't sell, then you and your staff can drink it. And if it does sell, then give us a call after the weekend. And we did 50 stores that first weekend and after the weekend. And the 50, and I, I really mean this, 50 said no. Because it was back then, it was like we were trying to sell bottles for £1.79 when there was nothing other than cans of Coke for 60p. So it, it was just like way out of the sort of the norms. So they all said, no, it won't sell. So we said, we'll try it for free. And 45 out of 50 reordered. And then we were in the smoothie business. And there was, there was no step change in the business. It was just every day selling a bit more, buying a bit more, then selling a bit more smoothies, buying a bit more fruit, selling a bit more. And it was just this organic growth curve. We, there was no big injection. There was no Series A, Series B, Series D. There was, we raised a bit of money to start. And then we didn't raise any more money until we sold. And it was... So we are a very old-fashioned business in that sense. And, um, but yeah, for us, it, it worked out. Uh, what were the other two ideas? You said that it was the third, the smoothies. Ah. Just curiosity. Well, uh, the, the, the thing that we, we'd set ourselves to think of, we wanted to make life easier and better for people. And our, our first idea was genuinely a thing called the electric bath, which was all about a bath that would fill itself to a pre-designated level and temperature, all at the touch of a button, because that university we'd had a we'd had a flat on the top floor of the building and left the bath running it overflowed and flooded four floors and so we're like shit that was pretty bad so so and then john was an engineer done engineering at college and he actually genuinely did some sort of first rough plans of how it would work in the drawings and we looked at them and we realized all of them had sort of electricity and water in close proximity to each other and make rather than make life better and easier we're just gonna make life shorter for people so we and then because we were snowboarding and there was a new technology, when you got to the ski lift, the thing just went beep and let you through. You didn't have, you used to have to put a card in. Was this, there was a thing, I don't, it was, is it IIR technology or something? I don't know. In, so yeah, anyway, so near state thing. We think, that would be amazing. Let's get rid of door keys. We'll get rid of door, because there's nothing more annoying. You come back to your house, carrying your stains with shopping bags. You have to put them down and get out your key. Whereas this thing, when you got within a meter, it would just pop open. I actually still think it's a great idea, but it, it still doesn't exist. There's sort of electronic locks and sort of keyhole cameras, but nothing where you don't, have to touch and the door just opens and funny I got married like I don't know when it was about 10 years ago and I on my honeymoon I I was given a card to my to my to to to, to, to the sort of you know the, the marital suite or, or, on, the, on the night of our wedding as I got close to it just went pop and open I'm like shit they've done it and then I kid you not I went into the bathroom and there was a bath that you could set the temperature and it would fill it. So it was like completely ruined my honeymoon. I was thinking, oh my God, that someone's done it. But so anyway, they were the, they were, but I think smoothies was the better one of the three. It was, certainly was the easiest one. We're like, we've never set up a business before. We don't really know what we're doing. Let's start simple, buy fruit, crush it, put it in the bottles, sell it. Two things. One is uh, it'd be very nice to know what Simon Cowell's advice was. But uh, on, the other, on the other front, Effectively, I presume you describe yourself as private equity in some sense, and I have to, I'm a lawyer, and so private equity generally is, for me, quite a, a sense of dirty term, because generally they're there to make money off of other people's backs, and you're clearly, your philosophy is entirely different. Um, how do you make it easy for people, and how, in some sense, do you square those two circles in that way? Yeah, well, I mean, as I've sort of come to understand the terms private equity, I think, is when you're sort of later stage, isn't it, and you're sort of, you're using big money to go from sort of, you know, you're, I don't know, you're, you're already running in three markets, you need to go to four or whatever, and we're like, we're, we're, we're the first money in, so we're, 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 we're for us, it's, it, it's sort of a roulette wheel, really, um, so I think the very, na the very fact that we exist to put money into things that are destined to fail is, is one thing we're doing to help these things exist in the first place. The, the secondly, the, the reality is, of course, loads of recommendations come in from network, people that we know, la, la, la. But if you go to the Jamjar website, there is an email address. It just says bread at jamjar.investments.com. And someone that doesn't know us, that may have never done it before, will firstly be coached on the website how, what to do, how to write a business plan. Here's some examples of good ones. Here are the kind of things we look for. This is the kind of deals that we do. If you like the sound of that, send your plan into this email address. We haven't done many through that but we've definitely done some through that. And every single one, and we get two and a half thousand a year, every single one gets looked at, gets taken seriously until the point where it can't be taken seriously any, uh, anymore. So it's available to everyone. You've still got to have known about it and taken the initiative, but entrepreneurship is self-selecting. It's, it's definitely not about universities. Like some of the best people we've backed left school at 16. Actually, if you look at actually, if there's any trend, there's the more successful entrepreneurs, the earlier they left education. There's also a, a huge over-index of people um, with dyslexia. So I'm not trying to min minimize 
that I think the world is massively stacked in the favor of sort of white, Western-educated men like me. And so I'm a massive benef beneficiary of it. But entre entrepreneurship, it's still ultimately, it, it's, it's not about who you are, where you come from. It is about, have you got a brilliant idea? Are you going to do a half kill yourself delivering it? And we, and we will back the people that have satisfied those criteria. And what was Simon Cowell's idea? Advice. Well, he gave this sort of great thing about sort of if you're managing people, he said, if, you, if you're actually managing people in business at work, he said, you just got to remember that everyone's got a, an invisible sign on the head saying, make me feel important. And I realized looking back, he's like, he made me feel important. I was given 10 minutes at the end of his 12 hour day of shooting. I thought he was going to be rude and ignore me. He gave me an hour and a half. He spent the first hour asking about me. Now, I met 65 people for that book. Not a single person asked a question about me apart from him. So he was like a massive inhabitor of his own insight, which is that's. It's how you get the best out of people and the best out of relationships. You just remember, it's make them feel important, listen to them, find out how it's going for them, and then maybe you tell them your story. You are selling a physical product, but in terms of the marketing, do you feel you're selling a solution or a lifestyle or a physical product? What, what is it you're attempting to sell? Wow, I, I love that question. Um, can I answer that question? That's, so we always used to say 95% of our marketing strategy was the product, right? We're old school. It was, you say, it's a product business. And um, the reason why people buy smoothies is firstly because it's there. I eat, it's on a shelf so someone can, can actually see it. And you only get that distribution in the first place because the, the buyer, the person that's the gatekeeper to that, they have to believe that your product's going to sell better than the alternative they could put there. So it firstly comes down to, do they think it's a better product? So you've got to go in there with something that looks better, tastes better. You've got data showing that in a blind trial of 100 people, 86% chose this one, R1 over, uh, over the competition. So it's definitely, definitely product. And the product absolutely includes the packaging because the way that the innocent packaging looked amplified and communicated why the product was better because it was more natural. So it was a see-through bottle rather than everyone else's bottle was cloudy because our juice looked fresh because it was rather than from concentrate where it looks all a bit brown. So you can't really show it. So you, you cover the bottle and then put on a label that's a photograph of an orange because you can't show your juice because your juice doesn't look orange. Whereas ours is fresh, so it looks orange. So we can show the juice, which means we can do a label that doesn't have to have a boring picture of an orange on. We had a like, cool, interesting logo. and So all these things come from... The, the nature of the product. But there was actually, I wouldn't call it a lifestyle, because that for me is way too overclaimy for a sort of like, um, you know, at the end of the day, we're, we're just selling some fruit. But there was definitely an atmosphere. And I, I was thinking, and it, it's a slightly cringy word to use, but I, I took, you know, brands are ultimately about transmitting a vibe. And it comes from what you do, what you say, the way you say it, the way you look, the way you say it's all, it's all, it's just, it's, it's lots and lots of different things. And consumers have an incredible subconscious bullshit detector. And if anything is incoherent or inconsistent with the central sort of proposition, even if they don't, some, even if they don't consciously notice it, they subconsciously notice it. And you just sort of get downweighted in their sort of trustometer. So the one thing I can say about Innocent is the thing that we purported to be, we actually were. The way that, the way that what we made matched what we thought, matched what we said, matched how we looked, matched the tonality. It was all about, and I could sum it up in one word, it was about being natural. And so that sort of atmosphere and approach allowed what was essentially a better product to feel like uh, an engaging brand. But it was always mostly about the, 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 the physical reality. The other stuff was just the, the, the way to sort of, as I say, get remembered and understood and loved. Your time is incredibly precious. You could be anywhere in the world speaking to any number of people. Why are you here? Why am I here? Uh, for every reason, from the best sort of altruistic reasons to the most selfish commercial reasons, right? So, and via some nice reasons. So uh, altruistically, uh, I believe that fundamentally that the change, change only happens by people standing up and doing something completely different, right? And uh, Nano is doing that. And um, uh, if you look at w w how does society work, because society works by people having access to some degree of income and wealth. And the only thing that creates that is, is, is business. I love charities. I'm involved with loads of them. But charities only have income because they've got people to ask donations of or governments to receive grants from. And governments only have money to spend on NHS because people have 
jobs and jobs are new start from business. So anything that's at the front edge of sort of trying to create sort of new wealth, new business, it, it's, it's going to benefit some people a shitload more than others. But net of all, it's going to, if we can change things, loosen things up, bring a bit more wealth into society, long term, it, it sort of raises the bar. So I believe in sort of change and progress and all that kind of sort of stuff. Uh, I'm also, I, I, I'm, I'm proud to be a close friend of Georgia. And, you know, she asked me, like, yeah, she's on my yes list, right? Whatever, the, whatever it is, I, like, I, didn't, I said actually, if even you get to the end of the sentence, the answer is yes, right? Thirdly, I bought some Nano. Because, you know, I put my money where my mouth is. I'm, I'm a believer. And the only really, you, you judge people on their beliefs, not by their words, but by their actions. I own some. Can't say it's worked out great so far, but Thank you know. You. <laughs> All right.